So my name is Miriam Lomman. Uh, I'm from clinic Clinical Psychology. And thank you so much for the invitation to actually present my research here to you. This is really weird because I can hear myself really weirdly through this thing. Anyways, I'm going to get used to it very quickly, I'm sure. So I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit more about my research. Um, and one of the studies I've done is on guilt in post-traumatic stress disorder. But before that, let's start big. I think the world is a beautiful place. Even though we all know that you know, lots of bad things happen. So, you know, you've got people who are in accidents, robberies, you've got floods, earthquakes, I mean, wars going on. So actually, we all know it's not only a beautiful place, right? And lots of people actually experience what we call traumatic events. One of the things that can happen is that you actually have, after experiencing such a, such a well, traumatic event, you could go on and develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is this? So if people might not know, be that familiar with it, PTSD is characterized by several sets of symptoms. So the first one is actually intrusions or re-experiencing symptoms. So that involves like having nightmares about a traumatic event, but also having distressing thoughts or images just during the day popping up that are really distressing to you. The second cluster is actually avoidance, so you actually will try to avoid anything that reminds you of the traumatic event, thinking about it, uh, people or places that remind you about it. Third set is negative alterations in cognition and mood, so you've got a low mood, you find it difficult to connect with other people, for example, you have negative thoughts about the world, it's not a safe place anymore, that kind of stuff. And the last cluster is actually alterations in arousal, uh, but also in reactivity. So that might include irritability, anger outbursts, also concentration problems, for example, sleeping difficulties, and also being very hyper-aroused. So that means that there's a noise outside, and immediately your body reacts to it. And you've got this kind of frightening response from your body. So what's very interesting is that actually what fascinates me is that almost everybody, unfortunately, will experience a traumatic event in their lives at some point. However, so after that, it's actually really normal that you have these kind of symptoms because it is quite an abnormal thing to do. It's not something that a traumatic event is not something you, you come across every day, usually, hopefully, for you. So you will have these kind of reactions, but most people actually naturally recover from it. That means within the first weeks or month after that traumatic event, these kind of symptoms subside again. But then in a minority, so that means twice as, well, women are twice as likely to keep experiencing these symptoms, but about 10 to 17% of the people will actually keep experiencing these symptoms for longer than a month. They might develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think if you look at the lifetime prevalence, it's about 7.5% uh, in the Netherlands at least. And this picture nicely well, sums, it up, uh, sums it up for me. So that means we know we live in a world and bad things happen and somehow some people will stay at this side, at the green, lovely side of the world. They will see the world as a nice place to live in. And other people actually stay on the dark side and see the places of a dangerous world and not a nice place to be in. And this is one of the research questions I'm fascinated by and I dedicate my research to. It's like understanding like why do some people actually go on and develop post-traumatic stress disorder after, well, experiencing such a traumatic event, well, uh, well, others do not. So what we know, we could actually make a distinction between several factors that play, might play a role in here. So first of all, we've got pre-trauma factors. That could be something like personality, um, individual differences usually, they could make one more vulnerable to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. The second factor is peritraumatic factors. So it could be something like um, characteristics of the event itself, of course, 
but also feelings or uh, during the event. And then you've got post-trauma factors that could involve, for example, social, social support after being gone through such an event, right? And I think all of these questions, all of these factors are very interesting because they might all give you some idea about what might be effective for an intervention to help these people who are actually suffering from PTSD. So I want to focus on the peritraumatic factors now. So one of these... Um, Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory of that. Um, so PTSD was originally seen as an anxiety disorder. It was also classified as an anxiety disorder in the DSM-4. So there was a lot of emphasis on this fear and anxiety, right? But what we see in clinical practice, it's not only fear and anxiety that you see. You see a lot of other emotions, negative emotions. So, for example, there's a lot of horror, but also anger, guilt, shame, disgust. And with the DSM-5, you see there's more like acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement of the other negative emotions. So these are actually now included in a DSM-5. And one of the factors that I was interested in is actually guilt. So the concept of guilt, and this is a definition um, used by somebody else, it says, involves moral transgression, real or imagined, in which people believe that their action or inaction contributed to negative outcomes. And although we know that's, that guilt plays a major role in a lot of, at least for a lot of uh, people suffering from PTSD, we don't really understand how this, these two concepts of PTSD and guilt are related. So, I had this student, this is Konstantin Bub, and I have to really thank him a lot for this. He's done a great, he's been a great uh, student, he's done a lot of work on this. So he's been working with me in his third honors, um, uh, as a third honors year student, and he's been doing his research with me. And we focused on um, this relationship between guilt and PTSD. So. There are several theories about how these PTSD and guilt might actually interact or be related. So there's a few models that have been put forward. One model actually says it's trauma first that leads to actually guilt, and then that will actually help, will be a main factor in the development of PTSD, right? Then there's a second model saying like, well, you first got trauma, then you develop PTSD, and then you actually experience guilt because you feel guilty about you know, all the changes you've been through and you might not be you know, fun fully functioning. So guilt is more, more or less like a consequence of having PTSD, right? Then the third model actually says, no, it's trauma that actually both elicits these guilty feelings, these guilty feelings, but also PTSD. And then the fourth model, well, it brings in depression and shame, actually, as a kind of mediator between uh, trauma and PTSD, and as a consequence, you, have, you feel guilty. Well, what we want to do in this study is actually focus on this first model and experimentally test whether trauma would lead to guilt and whether guilt would actually contribute to the development of PTSD. So what we did, we used um, a non-clinical sample and an analog trauma, so that's a stressor in the laboratory, right? And we want to let them face this analog trauma, then manipulate the guilt, and see whether it influenced the occurrence of PTSD-like phenomena. So what we did, we had a PC crash incident. That means people came into the lab, and there was, well, there was a PC crash, which wasn't true, a truly uh, PC crash, but it was one. And then we had great acting work from our student, and he would just act like he would be devastated, and you know, he's like, oh, this is terrible because all my data is lost now. And it's a bit like his interpersonal stressor, I would say. And then the main manipulation was that one group of uh, students, or participants, main, or students actually, would get blamed for uh, this loss of data and, and you know, the PC crash, whereas the other group, they wouldn't be blamed. The, like, my student would just tell them, it's like, oh, it's just this technical failure, you know, the stupid computers. 
So that was the main manipulation, and what we're looking for, of course, we're hoping that one where we induce the guilt that only the first group where we personally blame them for this data, a loss of data, that they would feel guilty and the others won't, wouldn't feel guilty at all. Uh, of course, we wanted to know what the consequences were, right? So we asked them to fill out a diary about their intrusions. And of course, we were interested in the intrusions related to this uh, crash, uh, but we'll tell you in a bit how we fixed it because we didn't want them to know, of course, what we were testing. Um, and in the end, we were interested in the frequency of these intrusions related to the PC crash and also how distressing these intrusions were for them. So we had a few cover stories, <laughs> and they worked out really well, I have to say. So the first one uh, was we asked them to, to keep a diary on changes in awareness of sustainable behavior after watching a video clip. So we first actually let them watch a video clip about sustainable behavior, and then we would have this PC task. We told them, you need to keep a diary, and we said, just Every time you have an intrusion, like a thought, an image about the research, your participation, write it down. And then, well, tell us what the content was. So we later on could actually distinguish whether it was an intrusion related to the film, or <laughs> which wasn't you know, supposed to give you any intrusions, or to actually the PC crash. So it was a cover story for that. And then we had the PC crash itself. So we said there's a different task we want you to do. We're just testing out keyboards. And um, so you've got this keyboard. We want you to type in five letter words as fast as possible and be very accurate. But don't press the, there we go, don't press the old key. Because we've had major problems with that before, the computer might crash. But just, just make sure that you don't press it. And of course, at some point, we have some letters close to the old key, and then the computer would crash, you know, fake. But, and, um, well, we would of, then, of course, tell them, like, the, in a blame group, well, you press the old key, I can see it on the computer, you know? So, oh, so we would blame them for uh, letting the computer crash. And in the other group, we would tell them, oh, it's just a stupid technical failure. OK, so this is what it looked like. We had the baseline measures of emotions. Of course, we wanted to know the baseline level of guilt. We had lots of other emotions as well, so people didn't know we were interested in guilt only. We had a cover, cover story film, right? The typing task, then the crash. And then, well, 19 were blamed, 20 weren't blamed. They had this intrusion diary for a day. We also measured guilt just after the crash, of course, and one day later again. And we'll just go to the result. And sorry, I'm, I know it's really small for you probably to see. So I'm going to just, but you can see the lines, right? So I'm just going to explain this to you. This line is the blame group, and this is the, the feelings of guilt. So you can see there's a significant increase for the blame group. And there's no change for the non-blame group. So luckily, they didn't feel guilty about this technical failure. And this is actually before and after the crash. This is actually follow-up, so you see it's not very long-lasting. We only debrief them at here at follow-up, so one day later. But you see, I mean, they were, we, they felt guilty, but it's not, it's still ethical. It went down already in one day. All right, and of course, this is the most important thing. Here we were interested in the number of intrusions and the distress. So here. This is the number of intrusions. So you see zero till three, so it's not too many, but for, you know, I think we're quite happy with, if you look at the research, a couple of intrusions a day is pretty good. You're not doing damage to, the, <laughs> to your participants, uh, but it's also, it, it does, there is a difference because here there's almost no intrusions in a non-blame group, whereas in a blame group there's about three intrus intrusions. And then if you look at the, the distress that's caused by it on a scale from zero till 10, you will see that for the no blame group, it's actually about a half the intrusions that they have had about PC crash, whereas for the gr blame group, they found it quite distress distressing, six out of 10. So I think we were very happy with this result in the sense that we managed to induce guilt and see, well, found a difference in intrusions. So our main conclusions were that feelings of guilt as a reaction to a stressor were actually related to a higher number of stressor-related intrusions and associated distress, right? So guilt 
may contribute. Now it's CSA, may, may. So just be cautious about what I'm saying, but may, may contribute um, to the development of PTSD, uh, or at least symptoms of PTSD like intrusions. And I think if you look at the clinical implications, it means that it is important when you're dealing with patients with PTSD, not only focus on fear, but also focus on other feelings, negative feelings like guilt, because they might contribute to symptoms and intrusions. All right, so this is just one of the studies uh, I've done uh, and I think I keep, I'm just fascinated by this question and try to understand, there's lots more to understand, of course, uh, to why people might develop PTSD while others might not. And I hope to continue this line of research. Thank you for your attention.